It's great to be here on the podcast again with uh, Stephen McManus, reserve team coach at Celtic. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Donald. How are you doing? You well? Hi, good, good. How are you getting on in this lockdown? Um, we're, we're, we're well. Uh, family are all keeping safe and healthy, which is the most important thing. Um, the same as everybody else, there's been challenges that nobody, <laughs> nobody felt as if they would ever have to face. But um, no, we're all good. There's, there's certainly been a lot of positives. So you've, it's been a good time to sit down and reflect, Donald. That's yeah. the one thing that I felt as if um, it's been really good for just to look at how our seasons went, what, what you can improve on as a coach, as an individual try and gain as much knowledge as you possibly can and it's been nice to actually spend a bit of time with the family as well because we've, no, we've never had the chance to do that for a long period of time. I know that that's that's something that's so true isn't it I, I don't think I've been home as much in about 30 years as, as four months you know I have been on the road. Absolutely Donald you know I said that to my wife this is probably the first time that we've spent as much time as this for we've been, for we've been young kids and um, so it's been nice. It's been it's been nice to see they spend a bit of time with the children as well. Don't get me wrong, the homeschooling I've completely left to my wife. So um, when you saw summer holidays came about, it was it was nice that she got to put the books away. So, um, but no, it's been like I say, it's been a challenging challenging time for everybody, and, and, and you need to be very uh, appreciative of, of the things that you've got. And the most important thing was everybody keeping safe and healthy, and hopefully we can everybody can get through it. Yeah, great. So tell me a little bit about, you know, how you got into football as a kid. Did, can you remember when you when you, you thought, oh, this, I love this. Can you remember the I period think, where you got into I, it? I think it's probably similar, Donald, to a lot of other uh, lads of our generation as yeah. such. The, the, there wasn't a lot else to do for us yeah. back then when we were younger, but it was just constantly football, you know, we were... Back then, you were always at the streets. We never had, at that young age kind of thing, maybe five and six, you never had computers to, to sit in front of your screen to, to, to play all day. We were always out playing in the street. You were always in the kind of street that I was brought up on. I've got an older sister who's four years older than me, and just the way the, 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 the street was, the boys in our street were four years older than me, yeah. and the kind of girls as such were my age, so I ended up playing with older with older kids in the street, which the, the boys in my street, it was football constantly. Yeah. Um, and as you develop, as your skills then develop, you go and train next to, you go and train with different clubs from a young age, but you're probably only training with them an hour and a half a week, or sorry, an hour and a half a day, and the rest of the, the, the certainly in summer holidays and all sorts of holidays, you're, you're spending your time on the, on the streets playing with the ball constantly, and I was no different. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I mean, I spoke to so many people where, A, there's the whole street football thing and just playing with your mates on the street or behind the school or whatever is so important. But you mentioned it there as well. Like so many guys end up playing with guys older than you themselves as well. And do you think when you look back now, did, did, did was that useful for you in, in terms of your physicality and having to learn as you go? I think one of the things that, that, that you certainly don't realise, I, I never realised, I knew I was good because you, the older ones accepted you to play, but yeah. with that came with, with a lot of challenges that stand you in good stead for, for the future. Like you said, you were a lot smaller than everybody else, but you had no fear. Um, yeah. and, 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 and you ended up playing against lads for different kind of estates or schemes or whatever yeah. it was, you, and, and it was great. What... what what played a big part in our kind of lives growing up, Donald, believe it or not, we had a lot of which, when I look back now, it was incredible. So Jimmy Johnson stayed in the street below right. us. Yeah. And, 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 and a guy called Johnny Hamilton, who played with Rangers, actually stayed in our street. So at, at, at that time, you know, they were, it was completely normal for us to see Jimmy running the streets with, with, a, with a bin bag on or a sweat, yeah. a, a sweat top on or whatever. Yeah. So... In the area that we are in, looking back, it's incredible to think that you've had one of the greatest ever players that yeah. ever he's produced and he was running about the streets while you were playing on the streets. I know. But he was just known as as, as, as Jimmy. He wasn't known. You, know, you, you, don't, you knew, obviously, that he was yeah. grown up a Celtic fan. You knew all about him, but he was he was, yeah. he was no different for anybody else in the street, which when I look back now, it's, it's incredible to think that. Yeah, yeah. And very, I doubt if that would happen nowadays. It might happen now and again, but I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, you would, you would never ever have 
Yeah. It would never, but but that was the norm, and, and and we had a big grass area. It was called the gully that we used to, yeah. and it was funny because when Wimbledon was on, you were out playing in the streets. Ah, uh, and I, again, we 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 speak a lot about. I think it's multi sports is a is a, is is so, such an important aspect in developing young people nowadays. Yeah. We try and do it with our children as well, and you want to get them into as many things as you possibly can. So when we were younger, Wimbledon was on the telly. You'd be playing tennis in the street. Yeah. When the golf was on, you were up the park. Yeah. Up the park playing golf so it was you were always you were always out in the street honing your skills at any sort of sport that you could I know that is, is so true Steve. when you're speaking there I remember you know at Wimbledon fortnight you know as you say you were everyone was out and, and, and my age it was certainly you know you were out. I remember when Borg appeared as well and then everyone started trying two-handed backhands for a <laughs> time. for us it was you get the chalk you used to get the chalk and you used to write the you write the quote yeah. in the in, in the street, but it was it was even when you look back now to what we are developing. We played cuppy doubles constantly, yeah. you know, yeah. which, which in effect it's one v ones, it's two v yeah. twos, it's uh, three v twos, and, yeah. and, and 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 shoot. And that's what I'm saying. That's when you learn your. That's when you hone your skills as a as, yeah. as a young player. Even with the surface that you're on, you know, you're playing. Golf, so you need to work on your balance because you don't want to fall. Because when you yeah. fell. You would end up ultimately skin your knees. You'd hurt yeah. your elbows. So without even realising that you're working in your core, you're working in yeah. your in your balance, which I think is a great grounding. We yeah. we weren't lucky enough to play in grass pitches everywhere. I remember certainly with our boys' club. I played with Aberdeen Boys' Club in Blantyre, yeah. and our home pitches were were at Blantyre Sports Centre, which yeah. was four ash parks. We used to go to Aberdeen, and we would we would go to down to the borders and Scottish Cup day, yeah. and a. There was a grass pitch with nets. It was like Christmas morning. You could, oh, I'm sure. You couldn't believe the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we were brought up. Yeah, brilliant. And when did you realise, you know, that you wanted to be a player? You know, you wanted to be a pro player. Did you always have that? Or was there a moment you thought, oh, I'm going to do this for a living? No, I, even back, even again, when you were younger, Donald, you don't really... You don't really look at it at saying you're going to do it for a living yeah. as such, because I never had no idea that you'd have got paid. Yeah. Football, you'd have, yeah. You had no idea. What I realised is that I loved the game, whether it was on the telly. Yeah. You were watching games on the telly. Like I said, my family have grew up big Celtic fans yeah. as well. My, my, my dad was a, a Partick Thistle fan, he says, yeah. at times, but... So you were. It take me. I would go to Celtic games. I'd go to Partick Thistle games. If, if if either team was away from home, he would take you and watch the local pub team that was playing. So every Saturday in my life, it was spent going to watch football matches. Mm. Um, so it, it became an obsession as such. Mm. Um, and then when you realised that you were actually quite good at it, you had to um, two seconds there, Donald. Yeah. Sorry, when when you were. When you realised that you were quite good at it, that, that you realised that you had an opportunity and it was something that I always wanted to do as, yeah. as, as a young kid. If somebody had told me the maximum amount of money that I could have earned would have been £100 a week being a footballer, yeah. you would have still have wanted to have done it yeah. um, because you just loved the game and it was something that was so important mm -hmm. to you. And how did you get into, what was your steps then from you know playing with your mates and going into almost a pro club setup? or, or say, well, How did you get into that? Or the kind of pathway that I took, Donald, we, like I say, I played with my boys club, um, at Aberdeen Boys Club from a young age, and um, played with the school. You would then, I think I was maybe, back then you used to always get letters through your door, yeah. inviting you to go, come and train with certain clubs, so you get letters from, from, from Celtic, and believe it or not, from a really young age, I think I was nine and I was at Hibs as a, yeah. young, as a young player. And it was Brian Ewan and Martin right. Ferguson that were our coaches. Yeah. Um, and, and Brian Ewan and Martin Ferguson, who obviously is Sir Alex's brother, yeah. they were absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant people, brilliant coaches. And, and we used to train with them on a Monday and a Thursday night. Yeah. Um, and in the Easter holidays, the October week, and, and, and the summer holidays, they'd put like summer camps up. Yeah. Um, and my boys club was quite a decent side so I think there was about 10 of us for the boys club that went and for different different age groups and that was brilliant so that mm -hmm. was my I would say from nine I was in a professional club yeah, but yeah. it wasn't it wasn't you, you hadn't signed with that club or anything mm. you, would just, you would just go and train and it was brilliant it was everything was technical there, yeah. was, there was nothing that wasn't working that wasn't um, technical based training which 
which was great. Um, so that had a big impact on you. And then um, I then progressed through. So it was, again, still playing your boys club, but yeah. I, I think I was under maybe th- 13s or 14s um, when the kind of boys club football stopped mm. and became like Scottish amateur or mm. the kind of pro youth. Um, and Celtic were, every summer Celtic were on the phone for me to go yeah. in and, and the, believe it or not, the scout that took me to Celtic was, was Paul McStay's dad. Right. John McStay yeah. and Hugh McGovern, who's now my kit man with the reserves. So Celtic was 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 a place that I went from maybe, again, I got asked if I was nine, I would go to tournaments, but I went there maybe when I was when I was 14 and that was you starting then on the, the progression to, to, to go. What was it like then to get involved with Celtic, being a, a big Celtic fan at that age? It was great. Donald, it was it was it was terrific. It was a big big thing, even putting on the jersey for the first time. Mm. Um, but probably, I, I was very fortunate at the time because I again get back to you, infl- like mm. talking about influences. My dad probably has had the biggest influence mm. in my career, Donald, that anybody's ever had. Yeah, at a young age, at 12, 13, 14, that's when the club started wanting to sign you. Yeah, and back then I think it was S forms that so. Yeah. Hibs were wanting me to sign an S form, Celtic were wanting me to sign an S form at the time, but it wasn't something that my dad ever allowed me to do, which was terrific, because what that allowed you then to do from, I think I was maybe 12 years of age, is when you're kind of one of the better players in the country at that age group, and there's different scouts for different clubs, so there was English clubs started yeah. kind of sniffing about, and because I hadn't signed an S form, I was able to go to, I was able to go down to Everton, Man City, Aston Villa, Newcastle, yeah. As well as Celtic, Hibs, and a lot yeah. of teams up here, which was great. Whereas if you had assigned for one club, yeah. you'd miss out and going to see these different different yeah. clubs. Which I think again, what was, I was maybe fifteen when they, I remember saying to my dad coming down the stairs one night and saying, "Dad, look, I'm, I'm, I think I've made up my mind. I know who I want to sign yeah. for, and I want to sign for Celtic." So if I didn't have that influence, influential yeah. figure, a father that I had. I would have maybe have jumped too soon into a club that maybe wasn't right because my family supported the club or yeah. whatever. But my, my dad yeah. was very, very stubborn and, and, and saying, look, you, you make sure you see different clubs to, to make up the opinion of where you want to go because I'm a big believer in, Donald, if you're not comfortable in the environment yeah. that you work in, you're not going to develop at the rate that, 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 that you should. How important, Stephen, do you think it is to, to have you know, a, a right kind of positive, strong influence at that age, especially, you know, at 12 to 14 to help you develop your name. You know, you had your dad, uh, yeah. you know, um, how important do you think that is? I, th- I think it's one of the main factors, I think, is honesty and trust, Donald. Mm. Um, and, and, and I see it now even when, when, when I've come through and now I'm on the opposite side and I'm on the coaching side. Yeah. Coming through all the way as a young player, through boys club, through pro youth teams and whatnot. Mm. I think parents have such a pivotal role in, in the development of the, of the young player. Um, I don't think they can put too much pressure on them. I think they need to let them breathe. They need to, they need to let them find their own way, their own path, their jobs to guide them. Um, and I, I was lucky enough that I had that. As, as, and, and my dad, he was never one yeah. that was standing. Sometimes I look at a lot of parents and my experiences over the years with it. They congregate together, they all stand in the one corner, they all say, oh, they basically want to suck information out of each other yeah, yeah. because they want to know that their boys are not getting treated poorly by the club. Yeah. Clubs don't treat the boys yeah. poorly that way. It's just an added pressure that gets put on that comes from the parents. My dad was never that type. Yeah. He always watched the game himself. He always, but he was, he could bite your bottom dollar. He was my harshest critic as soon as we went into the car. Yeah. But again, he was always, he was, he was very, he, he trusted the coaches to do their yeah. job. He wasn't a coach. He played the game at junior level. And so he had a very good idea in the game, but mm. he was, he always seemed to say the right things at the right time. And I remember, because it's a really difficult journey, Donald. Yeah. And I think that's, I think it's so under, people realise, they don't realise the, the sacrifice, the dedication, yeah. the hard work that, that has to go into it. Yeah. And the knocks that young players take, yeah. um, even in this situation just now, for me, the, the biggest, the, the the biggest attribute you can have as a young player is resilience. Yeah. Um, it's, there's 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 no doubt, and you only you only get resilience, you only build resilience when things don't go your way, and it's yeah. how you react from that. Mm. Um, 
So again, I never had I never had parents that constantly told me how great I was, yeah. or that that I, I was going to it was just going to be a walk in the park. I remember breaking down at seventeen, maybe, yeah. in my mum and dad's living room because at that point Martin and who took over at Celtic. I was yeah. playing at the youth team. I was the captain of the youth team. I was one of the main players and. John Robertson and Steve Walford came to watch us play against Livingston and we got beat 5 or 6-2, which was a disaster for Celtic. And I remember breaking down in my, lab, my mum and dad's living room saying, like, I'm, I'm not good enough for this. Um, and that was a real pivotal moment because I then, I knew I was, I, I felt as if the pressures of everything had just got so much. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know how to, I, I didn't know what the, 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 the coping mechanism was. Um, and I had my parents there they kind of put you on the, on the but just to give you that belief and then if I never had that support network probably at that moment I would never have went on to have been as successful as what I became That's superb Stephen and I, I was thinking as you were speaking you must have you know a great relationship with your parents there and especially at, you know that teenage years because to trust them to be patient at that age is huge as well isn't it because it, you know, the impulses is there to jump at anything, really. Even when you, when you become a parent yourself, Donald, yeah. you know, I know what it's like when, when my, one of my daughters come in from school and they've maybe not had a great day at school yeah. and they're upset or they're at dancing or, or, or netball and, and it doesn't go their way. And the easiest people to blame is the coach. Yes. It's the easiest thing to do um, because it's, it's like a dagger through your heart when you see your own children getting upset. So... When I look back and, 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 and at that moment where, where, where I've, I'd, I had self-doubt, had creeped into myself yeah. to say, I'm not good enough, I'm not ready for this. The last thing that my parents w- would ever have done would have been straight on the phone to, 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 to Tommy Burns as the academy director, yeah. as to Willie McStay and Kenny McDowell, mm-hmm. my coaches and Chris McCart to say, what are you doing wrong? It's yeah. Ultimately, it lay with me and I knew that I had to work even harder and make so many and this was normal Donald I think yeah. I think setbacks in sport is the only thing that you can guarantee yeah. um, I think that's a, a great story you know because and you know I, I see so many young players and, and just young people in general that think that the self-doubt they shouldn't have the self-doubt or they shouldn't have the vulnerability when something goes against them. and of course that's that's just normal, isn't it? It's what you do next and how you come through it. Isn't and, and again, I think it's, I remember I remember speaking to Gordon Stratton a few, God, a, a few years, but it's always kind of stuck with me. I think he, I think he was in charge of the national team at the same time, and and and, and he texted me. I meant for a coffee just to, for a catch up, um, and I said that I asked him because I knew I was wanting to go down the coaching route as such, and I asked him like, what's What's the best? What what have you found the best thing about coaching and, and management? And it's and all the times that he's won games, and you would just expect him to rhyme off these kind of moments. And he actually says that it's building relationships with people, and yeah. it's, it says it's the best the best feeling in the world when you get an ex player that still wants to text you or phone you for advice. Or and there's that relate. I think having some sort of mentor is so important, Donald. Yeah. Um, and again, I had that with. We, we, we Kenny McDowell as a young player and Wally McStay and Chris McCartan, all the coach, they were always there for you. Yeah. Um, because as you say, self-doubt is absolutely normal in, yeah. in sport, especially in, in football. Um, it's because you don't believe, I, I remember even my, the night before I, I played in the, my, my Champions League uh, debut and I remember thinking, saying that, I, there's no way that I can play at this yeah. level because I've sat Watch Man United won the treble in '99. You've yeah. you've always watched the Champions League music, something that's been yeah. s- such an important part of your life. And now you're the next night you're going to be the one that's going to be in that environment. It's yeah. but then you, you trust your exp- and you trust the hours that the hard work that you've put in, and it only that prepares you for that moment, Donald. And I, yeah. I'm a big believer in that. If you prepare for that moment, whenever that moment come might come, you will be ready for it. Yeah. I love, I think that is so true, Stephen. I live with the Muhammad Ali. Someone asked Muhammad Ali years ago, you know, when he was starting almost, like, how could he be so confident? And he says, how can I, how can I lose with what I use? And Angelo and Dundee would say, first person in the gym, last person out. Yeah. Absolutely. And you, you, you don't, you, you've got, you've got the hardest part, and this is again where resilience has to come in because you've got no idea as a young player when that opportunity is mm. going to come. 
you've got no idea. You might be, you might be the best goal scorer under 15, 16, 17, 18s at whatever club you're at, but you might have ended up having the best the best player that the country's ever produced or the best player the yeah. club's ever had is the number nine. How are you going to get them out? How are you going to... So you need to have that drive. You might need to leave the club to go somewhere else. It's, it's, but you need to be resilient. But that moment will come. That yeah. moment will come. He'll pick up an injury at some point or the opportunity for him to move on will, 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 will arise and then you're thrust into that limelight. But if you're not prepared for that moment and preparing for the moment as how dedicated you are to your profession. Yeah. The hours yeah. that you put in is, 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 is what's going to separate you from, from yeah. other people and your, and your, your young team. Your, your Were you always kind of disciplined in your preparation and your focus, Stephen, coming through the, coming through the ages? I would, I would say that was probably my biggest strength. Donald, mm-hmm. I was, as, as a young player, I, I, never drank, I think I had my first al- alcoholic drink when I was... 22 maybe mm. 23 which is is late on because I I didn't want I didn't want my opportunity to mm. I didn't want to be one of the players that that you could have said what a, what a good part he yeah. was a great one he was yeah. but my, I, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts and whatnot just now Donald and, yeah. and, and the psychology side of the game and a lot of people talk about the uh, you, you shouldn't have a fear or something. Yeah. As such, because you can never really get to your full potential, fear of making a mistake. What drove me on was a fear of failure, believe it or not, Donald. Yeah. As a young yeah. kid, I did not want to be one that got tarred with a big brush of being released from Celtic. I didn't yeah. want to get released. Um, and again, there was so many Celtic. I think when you're young, you're very impressionable. Mm. The people that are maybe a year or two older than you yeah. start to think, there's no way I can be as good as them. There's no way. Yeah. So that's when, and before you know it, you start to see them doing certain things that, that maybe you don't agree when you think, yeah. I'm not going to do what they're doing because straight away that gives you a, an, an added advantage. Um, I was always looking for different ways where I could get a, a slight advantage in the person next to me. I think that, from an early age, you know, I think that, and you know, I've known and worked with a lot of, kind of young players coming through, and, and what you've said there is, I think, is what differentiates people that really make it a lot of the time than those don't, because I'm sure it's the same in other countries, but, you know, certainly in Scotland, I think there's, there has been uh, almost that thing to be, oh, well, I'm not wanting to be that different to not drinking. I'll go, at least I'll go with my mates a wee bit, or I'll go, you know, and just be one of the guys or one of the boys is a strong pool. Uh, Absolutely, Donald, and and that's, I had, I've still got the same mates that I went to school with and, and at 15, 16 there was parties in the in houses, there was parties in the in, but I, I was always training, I always wanted to go to training because I knew that was the I knew that was the 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 pathway that I wanted to take and it was it was something that was again probably installed in me in, uh, from a a young age, yeah. you know, from my from my parents, from the upbringing that I had. But I think you can only get out of something what you put in. And if, yeah. if I was going to fail as a footballer, I wanted to make sure that I, I would fail given it absolutely everything. Yeah. Um, I was I was a good player when I was when I, when I was younger, Donald. Absolutely, because that's you don't get to Celtic if you're not a good player. Yeah. I wasn't the best. I was I was, but I was not the best player. Um, but we, when I look back at the players that have been so successful in the last fifteen to twenty years at Celtic yeah. that have come through the academy, and even include that now. We, with James Forrest and Cal McGregor, everybody's got the same dedication to profession. Uh, different le- levels of ability, but the sacrifices and the dedication and the hunger that all the all the all the players had was was what separated them and, and made them successful. And and then when you you then become like an international player and you sit and you realise it's the same conversations that everybody has because you've managed to use of that group of players have been the, the elite in the country yeah. and they've got the exact same principles, the exact same messages, they've had the exact same um, problems that they faced as young young people, but instead of blaming, they looked for ways to solve these problems. And I think that when you take that, a problem or a challenge and can flick it over to think, how am I going to solve it? You know, that's what makes the difference even. And, and you had that and have that. And it's like the Van Persie, 
clip I'm sure you've yeah. seen when he, he said exactly the same to his son, didn't he? Don't blame people. Yeah, absolutely, because it's, it's the easiest thing in the world to do, Donald. You know, you, the amount of times even as I've tripped over a curb and I'm, the first thing I say to my wife is, it's I know. Hi. <laughs> it's, it's not the curb's fault. The curb's I know. Next. But, <laughs> and then you turn, and it's, and it's so difficult when you've got your own children because yeah. they're the exact same every day. I try and say, look, don't, don't blame them if, 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 you just need to keep working hard at whatever you're trying to do. But we're, we're, we're terrible in our country for a blame culture. And, and when things don't go well, it's, it's always somebody else's fault. So I always try and take responsibility of what's the solution? What can I do to make myself better? That's, that's just how, how, I, what, how I try and work things. And what coaches, when you, when you were playing in the first team and Celtic and going forward, what coaches really influenced how you played the game? So I would, again, when I look back, I had either brilliant education at, at Celtic coming through. So uh, my youth team coaches were was a guy called Tommy O'Neill, Willie McStay, mm-hmm. um, Chris McCart, mm-hmm. Kenny McDowell, and Danny McGrain were the reserve coaches. Mm-hmm. Tom Burn, Tommy Burns was the the academy director at, at times. So it's each each coach had different strengths and weaknesses, and were probably perfect for each stage of our development at that time. Willie at the under-18s with Willie and Chris and, and, and Tom and Neil were, the, the, everything was technical. It was terrific, really, really good. Very similar to Brian Ewan. Um, Tommy Burns had a big influence on on, on that as well. Um, then I then developed through into the reserves. And I would say at that point, probably Kenny McDowell had the biggest influence mm. on me because he was perfect to bridge the gap between youth team football and first yeah. team football. So the dynamics completely changed. The dynamics changed in a way where he was more ruthless in how he spoke. Mm. He was more demanding. Um, and he prepared you for men's football, whether that men's football was going to be at Celtic or whether it was going to be somewhere else. Even just his demeanour, he was, he, he, he was so aggressive, but in a really, really good way. No, no, you knew where the boundaries were straight away. Mm. Um, so Kenny was perfect. Kenny and Danny McGrain, brilliant balance with it. Um, so Kenny was perfect to, to 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 bridge that gap between a youth team and a and a first team. Yeah. Uh, the manager at the time had, when when Martin O'Neill was was when I was in the reserve, Martin had just come in, and Martin was a manager. Yeah. Donald, he was his he's, he's assistant manager, John Robertson, Steve Walford, his coach. Robert, uh, Steve Walford, really good coach, but Martin was a manager. So mm. it was, it was, he managed people, he was very demanding. So that's why Kenny McDowell's role, when I look back, my career was so important. Mm. Um, and then Gordon came in, obviously, and again, it was preparing for that moment. I had no idea that Gordon was going to come in and, and take a shine to a lot of us at that mm. time. But he did, but it was probably, again, it was because of the hard work that all the coaches that I had worked with as a young age, the habits that they had put into us, Gordon was impressed with all of us because he what work ethic was right, and then he then educated us that wee bit more again on on the tactical aspect of the game. But again, it was it was it was our dedication, it was profession, our humility, our how hard that we worked on a daily basis, and that was all down to the upbringing for the coaches that we had. Yeah, brilliant. And what would you say when you look back on your playing days? See, and what do you th- what you say was your highlights? What do you what do you hold in your mind as that was really special for you personally? I think when even when I look at every trophy that I won at Celtic, Donald, my debut was was such a a a, a, a monumental thing for mm. for my family. And then it's it's funny because there's almost football almost becomes like a kind of drug as yeah. such. Is I would have been happy playing at Celtic once, mm. but when you then do it once, your mindset then changes. You don't want to just play for Celtic. I had looked at it then and thought, there's so many players that have played for Celtic that have come through the academy that have maybe played five or six times and then they disappear into the sunset. They move yeah. somewhere else. You never see them again. So I wanted then more of it. And I thought, what do I need to do to then make this? I always set my challenges of trying to go to 25 games and 50 games, yeah. then 100 games and then... Bef- I remember when Gordon first came in, um, and I had been a first team player for two years, but I, I was never a regular under Martin O'Neill. But Gordon came in, and I, I, I started to play in the first couple of games of the season. And I remember that 
as a Celtic player, the first thing that you do when the fixture list comes out, you look to see when you're going to play Rangers. That's it's the a natural kind of occurrence, which is which is great because it's the games that you can't wait to play in. But I, I looked at that game for a different reason. I looked at it and I thought, if I can stay in the team in this game, yeah. I'll know that Gordon trusts me. If, he'll trust me a hundred percent if he puts me in at Ibrox. Yeah. And and it was maybe six or seven games into the season, and 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 that was me. I stayed in the, the team of that game. I played that game, and that was me off and running. Um, so they were proud moments, and then the first time again get back to represent your country. Mm-hmm. The first time I represented my country, standing in and in, in, in singing the national anthem when the music's going, it's amazing at Hamden. I've said this so many times to people: is that they, it's fifty thousand. You've got everybody going crazy. Mm-hmm. Everybody supporting you and the people that you can see are your family. Yeah. And it's a wonderful one. That, so you almost feel as if all the hard work that your family have put in, my dad and my two papas took me the full length and breadth of the country. Yeah. And you can see you can see your family singing the national yeah. anthem, which that's when you realise you're giving something back, Donald. Everything yeah. has everything's been worth it. Yeah. And that was that was how I was. I get the impression too, when you never ever took took anything for granted in terms of playing football? No, don't that. I made my debut at 21, which yeah. was like my era growing up. Was There was myself, there was John Kennedy, Sean Maloney, Liam Miller. Um, top, top young players <laughs> just below us was, 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 was Craig Beatty and David Marshall, Ross Wallace, Aidan McGeady. So there was a real, real core group, maybe about four or five years. But all the boys made their debut. Maybe John made his debut at 16. Sean made his debut at 17. Um, I, made, I made my debut at 21, so I yeah. felt as if I had to work that wee bit harder. And every day develops at different rates. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I didn't want to be the... I was never too concerned about being the first one there. I can almost want to be the last one to leave. Yeah. Um, because that I, I wasn't as physically developed. I, I, I wasn't a central defender when I was younger, so I felt as if I was learning a new position all the time. Um and it, my moment came at 21, so because I was late on getting that moment, I didn't want to give it up, and I wanted to, I wanted to play as ma- many games as I possibly could, and that's why I, 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 when I look back to the moves that I had made, even coming back to Motherwell, and I wanted to play, I wanted to maximise everything I had because I knew it was going to be a short career, and I felt I had lost a lot of games, if you like, in my mm-hmm. career because I hadn't made my debut till 21, but it was because you were at Celtic. Um, and, and that was the way I looked at it. Rightly or wrongly, that was my that was my pathway. And did you always set your? Because I think that personally, I think it's a great way to do it when you set yourself little short term goals the whole time, like you did there, very instinctively. Said yeah. if I can keep, stay in the team till Rangers, that means he trusts me, and I'm sure there'll be another goal after yeah. that. Absolutely, and and it was it's. As a centre half, you're not going to set goal. You're not going to set challenges to say you're going to score thirty goals a season, yeah. Donald. It's not going to be. It's it's going to be. My goals I used to set was in the close season example. I, I wanted to make sure I was training. I was I was always looking because I didn't want somebody to take my place. I think you need to, you need to, uh, you need to have aspirations. Again, it's going back to the fear of failure as such. Yeah. At that age, maybe it's not a, fa- a, a a failure as such, but it's always looking. Who's behind you? Can you keep make sure they constantly stay behind you? Who's in front of you? How do you get? So when I broke through at Celtic as a young kid, I looked at the, I looked at Bobo Baldy, Johan Mialbe, Jos Falhan, and I thought, how can I get in there? How do how do I get in that team? How do I get them out? What's what's it going to be to get them out? I need to move them out. How do I do that? But at the same time, I need to make sure that the younger players that were in my position below me, your Dan the Days, your Charlie Mulgrews, how did I how did I make sure that they didn't overtake me? Um, so I was always I, I, I was I, I never felt contented, and I always felt as if I had I, I, if you weren't moving, if you were standing still, you were getting overtaken. I think that I think you taught yourself when I'm listening to you speaking, Sarah, at a very early age that that are you, well, I suppose it's a it's a tenant of high performance. You have to deal with pressure and not you know, not wanting to fail or not wanting to let yourself down, you were able to transfer it then into doing something about it. And yeah. that's the difference between someone that can perform at a high level and someone that can be all right, but they don't know how to deal with the pressure to think, 
well, I don't want this or I'm scared of that and they don't know what to do, but you always could make a plan. You try to, I think what helps in, in doing that, Donald, is the culture that has been created and the environment that you're in. Um, when you then come through at a club like Celtic and at big clubs, the boys that are around you are very, very similar to yourself. When you get to the first team and you get to, the, they're very similar. So without even realising that you guys are pushing each other. Yeah. Sean Maloney's the best trainer I've, I've, I've ever I've ever seen in my career, Donald. He was, he was unbelievable. And a, one of the best players I've played with. A brilliant guy, somebody who I've got so much time for even just now. So you were inspired by your colleagues as well. You didn't want to let them down. You knew that if they were working as hard as what you were, as they were working, you wanted to have something with that. Whereas I think if there was maybe a culture of, if you had a culture where people almost tried to ridicule the ones that, yeah. that, that, that were working hard, and I think that happens at the younger age groups. I think that can happen at, at 15, 16, because sometimes it's cooler yeah. not, to be, yeah. not to work hard. Whereas if you can then have the opposite culture and you can insp- you can almost humiliate the people that don't work hard, yeah. I think that's what I think that's when people start, start to fall off the bandwagon because I don't think it's I think it's the hardest thing in sport is to really work hard on. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm, yeah. it's it's can you work as hard as you can when there's nobody hanging over you? Yeah. And that's that's this that separates good for great. That's what I've no doubt Andy Murray works just as hard when there's nobody watching them as what he does when there's somebody watching them. And that's the difference for me between getting to the top of your profession and just being able I think uh, when you were speaking there, Stephen, I, was, I remember it must have been one of uh, Chris Hoy's last races uh, for the Olympics when he, it was a relay goal he got. And they spoke to him after it and he spoke to what you were saying specifically. He said, I was coming round that last lap and I've never felt pain in my legs like it. And that's from a guy, you know, the size of his legs. And, the thing. and he said, then I, I didn't want, like exactly what you said, he said, I didn't want to let the boys down. Uh, and he that, found something else from somewhere. It's something that I find fascinating, Donald. And I've, I've always found this, and I would, love to, I, would, I would love to go and watch individual sports probably more because... As, as part of a team, it's brilliant to be part of a team and win yeah. something as a team because you feel valued. You feel as if you yeah. brought something to a team. Yeah. But on the on the flip side of that, I had so many poor games throughout my career, and we probably still won. So you can still you can still feel good about yourself because the team has won. But if you're in that individual, I think these guys, golfers, tennis players, cyclists, for the guys like it's athletes, it's the, because when we talk about self-doubt, self-doubt ultimately will creep in. Yeah. I've got another 10 guys that can help me out. But these, yeah. these, 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 these guys and girls that are the individual athletes, they're just, the buck lies with them. So how do they get to the top? It's, it's, it's their mindset, it's their, it's their mentality. It's, if they've got a sore hamstring, they'll go and see a, a physio. If mentally they don't feel right, what do they do? So they need to go and speak to them because yeah. it's, it's, everything relies on relies on them their own drive I think that shows a great curiosity about other sports and what we can learn as well see with tennis I've been involved in and I used to live in Wimbledon for years so I, I, I got to see a lot of them and the amazing thing about see the likes of Andy Murray and in tennis you have to win the game you can't you know you can't run the clock out yeah. you know so it's just as you said that incredible determination and um, drive coming within yourself how important though within say football or do you think relationships are then within your teammates and, and coach to play uh, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing now how important probably even more so now that I've, I've, I've went into the coaching side of the game mm. just how important relationships are relationships with players with staff members with colleagues with, with board members um, it's crucial. Before I started, Donald, I, I, when I started coaching, it was everything was about distances. I had to make sure that my size in my yeah. in my drill was. It had to be ten yards, no nine yards. If it was nine yards, I couldn't function because I, I, I feel as if I've got OCD. Everything has to be perfect. It's got to be, and again, it's just how I am. Yeah. But 
but it's relationships with people that are the most important. Um, and that's, it's, it's how to build these relationships. It's, it's recognise and understand what that individual needs. Yeah. Does he need to sit down and go through his clips? Do you need to then be positive? Do you need to be negative with him? Do you need to show things that are going to make him feel better? I think when you feel good about yourself, I think you perform at your, at your, at your best. Um, and, and that's when I look at Martin O'Neill. Martin O'Neill was a, he was a fantastic motivator and he seemed to say the right thing at the right time to everybody. Um, I only shot, spent a short period of time in, 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 in Brendan Rogers' company um, and, and Brendan seemed to have a brilliant mannerism with everybody at, 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 the, at, at the football club. So I think that's really important. When I look back to my own experiences with the coaches, I always felt as if at any point in time I could have picked up the phone. I remember I was in a car accident when I was when I was younger in, in the motorway. Um, nothing serious or anything, yeah. but my mum and dad were actually away on holiday. And the first person I picked up the phone to was Kenny McDowell to say, what do I do? Yeah, that's it's a sweet. sign, isn't it? Yeah. So when I look back now, it's out with my parents. I never phoned an aunt or an uncle, my grandparents. Yeah. And I, I, phoned, I phoned Kenny to say, what do you do? And yeah. the first thing Kenny said was, look, are you all right to play the night? Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, <laughs> maybe I've, uh, certainly one of your players asked that when they asked them if they were all right to play. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it was that that was and that was the relationship that I thought yeah. when I'm on the other side of it now, you want the players to be able to trust. And I think trust is such an important aspect yeah. to sport. How have you found making that transition from playing to coaching then? What did you find did you find it challenging? Did did you find it was useful to be to play at such a high level for for such a long time? When I look back at my career, Donald, I think I was twenty nine thirty when my wife and kids come back up the road from Middlesbrough. Um, I had already started my B license at this point, um, and I always felt coaching was going to be the next kind of progression. For whatever reason, people always seem to have a bit of time for me in the game whether it was players, teammates, coaches, managers, you have your, mm. your disagreements with certain people, which is fine, but they always had a bit of time for you. Mm. Um, so I was at Middlesbrough at the time, that age, 29, 30, kids were up the road, wife was up the road, I would finish training, I would be in for nine o'clock, I'd finish at three, four, um, probably stayed longer than what you probably needed to because you didn't want to go home, I didn't want to go and watch a box set, I didn't want to... Mm. And I felt as if I was at an age where I wanted to learn. It was a fantastic academy at Middlesbrough at the time. So I went to the academy director. Um, it was a guy called Dave Parnaby, who is a brilliant guy. Real, real, real mm. good, genuine guy. And I asked him if I could help out with some of the academy teams. And he says to me, look, that would be great, Stephen. Nobody's, the only kind of people that have done that have been people that have come through the, the academy themselves at Middlesbrough. Mm. So he was terrific. So that kind of got me on the, on the coaching ladder. And that kind of got me the, the bug. Um, and then I was I, I went through a period at Middles where I wasn't playing and I asked Tony Mowbray if I wasn't going to be playing or on the bench could I then not travel with the team so that I could go with under 16s at the time but whenever he needed me to train and, uh, and play I would always be there so I thought I was 30 I didn't want to go all the way down and get left out which I never was and he was brilliant um, but I knew then that I wanted to, to kind of get down the coaching route so it was I would I would maybe take training twice a week for mm. 29, 30. I'd help with under 16, a guy called Paul Jenkins, who was a lead coach, and I just assisted him, and I learned a great deal. Then when I came back to Muddle, I wanted to make sure that I was playing week in, week out, but I was desperate to take the under 17s mm. and the 16s, and I started doing that. So I had I'd almost planned and, and prepared for that kind of journey, and I wanted, as soon as I'd finished my career, whenever that was going to be, I wanted to make sure my badges were done. I wanted to have done my... A licence, my B licence, my youth licence, my pro licence. Mm. I always had that in my mind. Um, Stephen Robinson then came to Motherwell and, and, and a fantastic, again, probably had, is one who's had a real influence on my mm. career as a coach, along with a lot of other people. Um, and he asked me to join his staff. Mm. So I, I was injured at the time. I had torn my groin. Um, just coming back, I still had mm. a year left playing, but I knew that and to be fair, a, a, a Robo, as, as soon as he got the caretaker job, he says, if I get the job permanently, this is what I'm wanting to do. And he was true to his word. 
Yeah. Um, so I come home to my wife and I says, look, I think I'm going to retire tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And she was kind of like, it was a complete bolt for the blue because I was yeah. 34, I was going to be 35 uh, the next week. But I just felt it was the right time. Yeah. I, I think when 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 I, I didn't want to drop down, I didn't want to drop down and play in the championship, yeah. which I probably could have for another two or three seasons yeah. minimum. Because I was, I looked after myself, but mentally I was ready to take, yeah. and also felt as if, if I could control my destiny, mm. it would be easier to deal with mentally. Because mm. I think it's a big, big challenge, isn't it? and I see it mm. with, with some of my own ex teammates and teammates. When the time comes that you need mm. to retire, I want to retire in my terms. Yeah. Um, and there's no way that I could have get the job that I was mm. doing. I'm doing at Celtic now if I hadn't have prepared for that journey. You must have always had a, a humility to learn, see, because I remember it must have been a few years ago when you did the B licence. Yep. And I asked a question about how confident everyone were with their co- something like their coaching knowledge. And yep. as most people do, most people say seven or eight. You know, yep. people say right, seven or eight. And I remember you said about four. Uh, and I took it as a great sign of your humility to learn. You know, I, you weren't. I've always, I've always looked at it being... Playing and coaching is two yeah. completely different things, Donald. It's it's because when you're a player, you go on that grass pitch, everything's set up, and you just go and do what's natural to you. Yeah. Um, when you go into the coaching side, it's I've I've I've, I've thought, well, I want to learn again. That's mm. why I'm I'm very ambitious, and I know where I want to get to, but I'm not in a rush to get there. Yeah. Um, I'm, I've I've got like I said, ex teammates and good friends of mine. I've went down the management route straight away and. Everybody's completely different, mm-hmm. but I'm trying to gain as much kind of knowledge as I possibly can and learn for different. But and again, it's come back to relationships. I've yeah. learned, I've, 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 I've built up a, a good network of people that, that if you need anything, you can pick up the phone. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's important in, in coaching because you're, you're learning all the time. You're learning mm-hmm. on the pitch. You're learning off the pitch, and that's just the way I am as a person. That I'm. I'm, I'm I'm not in a rush to, to to jump straight in because I want to make sure that I'm I'm, I'm well equipped. I'm well equipped to do that. Yeah. I was talking to Mark McGee about this a while ago, and Mark had said to me, he said, "Mick, you're never you're never ready to be a manager. You're never so. Yeah. You're better just taking the plunge." Yeah. Which I, I I thought was a great bit of advice, but for me it's been the opposite. I want to I want to learn off as many people as I possibly can, and I also really enjoy. I love being in the grass coaching. I really enjoy trying to make the kind of younger players better. Do you think that, because it's not that long ago you were playing, and yeah. do you think, can you see the game changing in any way now that you're a coach and involved in, in, in developing players? I think there's definitely a, there's our job, our, our, our job as coaches is to make players better every single day. Can they be better than what they were the day before? So we try and put, we need to, Whatever it is, we need to make them better to give the manager whatever whatever club you're at what he wants to put the players in. Um, but you're also trying to educate the boys in life as well because yeah. not every not every player at under eighteen level, not every player at reserve level, wherever you're going to be is going to be a professional football. Yeah. But you want them to make you want them to become good people. You want to educate them on life so that something might happen. They think you're trying to guide people in the right path, and I think that's what coaching is. I think a lot of coaching, probably your, your best coaching that you'll do probably takes place in an in a, a, in a analysis room or in a corridor. Because it's, it's, you want to see how people are really feeling, how they're really doing. Because if somebody says, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. They could be in the middle of lockdown. Their wife might have left them. They might have yeah. split up, but they'll still turn around and say, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. So how are they really doing? How are you? And you can only get that by building relationships. Yeah. Okay. And it'd been brilliant speaking to you, Stephen. If you had, just to finish with, if you had any advice for a young player coming through now, based on your experience and A, what you're seeing as a coach at the highest level, what would be some pointers you would give to a young player in today's world? I would definitely never be embarrassed to work hard, never be embarrassed to work harder than the guy next to whoever you're, you're working with. Um, right. and, and, and don't be ashamed to want to be the best that you can possibly be and always... Right. Always, always do as much individual stuff as you possibly can. Always, and there's no such thing as a, as a stupid question to ask. And, and do extra, do as much extra as you possibly can. Whether that's analysing your game, 
watching the first team play and the, posi- the, the guy in the position that you're playing with or your play, your, it plays in your position um, and be as dedicated as you possibly can be because if, if it doesn't work out at whatever club you're at, somebody will always, will always take an opportunity and somebody that's got a brilliant work ethic. Brilliant. Some great advice there, Dan. I really appreciate you taking the, the time to speak to me this morning, Stevie. No problem. See at all. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers, mate. Cheers.